Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to another version of Connorsville Speaks. We have a real honor tonight. Uh, we have three guests with us. Uh, to my right is Holly Dunn, and Holly Dunn is the uh, success coach at Connorsville High School for the freshman class. And next to her is Rick Williams. Uh, Rick Wright. I'll get it right after a while, because it's Rick Wright. <laughs> okay, Rick. I don't know much about you, so you're going to have to tell me. What, what do you do, Rick? I'm a youth pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, and I also help with the Haven and Fuel that Holly's a part of and help run Storm. Okay, and the Storm was last week. Yes, sir. Quite successful, I understand. Yeah. Had 1,200 in attendance. 1,200. Okay. And then, of course, everybody knows Mike Hartzell. He's the guy you call when you have a leak. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Mike, you've been involved in... This, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I moved to Connersville about 38 years ago. I uh, Where'd you come from? I came from uh, Wayne County, and I moved down here and uh, worked on the Heck Farm for a few years. I always did uh, cleaning on the side, and then uh, I went full-time, and um, now we employ about 24 people, and um, I met Holly, what, about a year ago now, Holly? Yeah, and uh, it's been a it's been real it's been real good since I met Holly. She's a good person. I yeah. really enjoyed working with her. Well, you know, I went to school. I had a guy in my class. I won't tell you what year we graduated. It's been a long time ago. But his name was Harry Hartzell, and I never yeah. heard that name again until I ran well, into you. Well, I'm not Harry Hartzell. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> but uh, Harry mm -hmm. was from Czechoslovakia. Is exactly. that where your family originated? No, they're from Switzerland. Switzerland. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Harry's grandmother didn't speak English, mm -hmm. and I can just hear her yelling out in Czech uh, yeah. speech, or whatever you would call it, and when she would be calling him. And I've kind of lost track of him, but I think he's still living. Well, we'll quit uh, reminiscing. We're, we're down to business now. Holly, you are the freshman success coach. Mm -hmm. I want you to explain to us, when I went to school, there was no such thing. Right. The... Uh, you, you had a counselor, but that counselor was for everybody in the school because I went to a little school. So tell me what a success coach does. Well, a success coach is, is different because basically now um, guidance counselors have to do so much. They do a lot of the scheduling and testing. There's just a bunch that they do. And all of the data shows that if a student is successful as a freshman, they have greater um, chances of being successful throughout high school. So the freshman year is kind of a key point <clears throat> when they come into the high school. There's a lot, I mean, it's a lot bigger than what they've been used to. And my job is essentially to help kind of meet them wherever they're at and, and help them be successful. Mm -hmm. So what are your credentials to be a su success coach to well, the freshman uh, class? I, I laugh because essentially it's a social work position. <clears throat> In college, I... My first major, I, I ended up with two degrees as an undergrad, a, a psychology degree and a communication degree. And uh, it's funny because I took my first, my first major was going to be education. My second major was going to be, be social work. And essentially, I never took a class in either of those, those areas. I went on and, and got my, my bachelor's in psychology and then a, a, a bachelor's of arts in communication at the same time. And, and now I work in a high school in a social work position. So you're not really a teacher? No, <clears throat> I'm not a teacher. And, and you know, I feel like probably what prepared me for this more than any kind of time, even at a, at a you know, in college, or and I, I do have almost a master's degree as well, is really life. Because mm -hmm. I, I grew up in, a, I'm a first generation college student. My, my dad and mom married very, very young and had lots of battles uh, before they kind of arrived, not, not that we any, any of us arrived, but they, well, they got married when my mom was 16 and had, had lots of challenges. My dad was an alcoholic, and, and so by the time I came along much later in life, I, I, my youth was easier than my, my brother and sister. However, I still, you know, we, school wasn't important. I had to kind of fight for that, and um, I really, as an adult, learned how to you know see that education opens doors and just it really changed my life and so I relate to kids probably more so than mm -hmm. maybe a lot of people. Does that I, I, I understand that because uh, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, 
I'm talking with my own daughter and talking with lots of kids at the school. I, they tour the city building from time to time, and everybody in the school knows who Holly Dunn is. Yeah. You're, uh, you're very famous out there, whether you're a freshman or a senior. Yeah. They know who you are. And when did you start this? When, what year did you start doing this uh, at Connorsville? Well, Connorsville's had the position, I, I believe this is the sixth or seventh year. I've been there four years. And um, when, you know, with being there four years, I, I've, I've had everybody in the class at some point or another. I've helped out with events and, and you know, have, I, I've sponsored the junior class. So as a, a class sponsor, I get to know a whole, you know, whole, the whole class. And it doesn't matter if you've struggled in high school or not. And so I really, at this point in the journey, I have four, kiss, four classes of kids mm -hmm. out there that I know. So that's how they, and they know, you know, I, I usually tell students that they can come see me for really any reason. If something's happening in life, they can come see me. But generally, I, if I call for them, I call for them um, if their grades are struggling, if I've noticed that they've missed more days than they should, if a teacher sees a difference in their behavior, you know, if, if, if you know, a student comes in and just doesn't seem right, a teacher might say, hey, you might check on this kid. I, I think maybe something's going on. Sometimes I have parents call me. I mean, I have mainstream kids across the board that parents will call me and say, hey, you know, I just, I've noticed this or that. Could you, could you call them in? And so usually those are the main reasons I see them or if, unfortunately, if they get in trouble. So yeah. if there's a behavior thing, um, I'll call them in. Otherwise, kids come see me on their own. We needed you when I was a freshman. You'd got me straightened out. Well, I, yeah. I, I do my best, I, yeah. you know. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> A lot of people still trying to straighten me out. <laughs> Even my wife. Well. Yeah. Well, all right, we established that you are a freshman success coach, but you're doing more than that. Um, you are now involved in this fuel thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I know a little bit about it, enough to be dangerous, I guess, mm -hmm. but uh, tell me about this fuel thing, because that goes way uh, out beyond school. It does, and, and does I... It, is it connected to the school at all? No. Okay. It, it, it kind of, I can't, I can honestly say it, it has to overlap in some aspects in that I see kids that know me outside of school, and because they know me outside of school, they are probably more likely to come to me in school. And so when there's, there's things going on at home, I think because I have that outside of school relationship, I'm probably the first person they come to. So... Fuel started four years ago. I started the high school in, in February. I started Fuel in April. And it's, it's kind of funny, my, my friends Jesse and Michelle Kelly, they had a daughter that was a senior in high school. And uh, they <coughs> really wanted me to kind of take some time and, and kind of do a youth program with her, just because at the time she wasn't really plugged in anywhere. And the same week that we started Fuel, I had a young man come into my office, and I think probably people have heard me say this so many times, and I, but he came into my office, he was 18 years old, he had a terrible story. At, at first grade, his parents had removed him from school, largely because they were trying to avoid uh, child protection. And at 18, I mean at 16, a neighbor had heard a domestic situation in the home, and the police had been called, and realized that the, this young man, not only was he being physically abused he hadn't been in school since he was in first grade oh my and uh, so they took removed him from the home at that time and got him into school they started him out in middle school so when I met him he was 18 and he was a true freshman so he it was his first year in the high school and he he was a, a unique kid I love him I love him but when he came into my office he had a mohawk and he had carabiners in his ears, which are those clips that you use when you go like rock climbing, with crocodile feet dried out and hung on his ears. And uh, if he walked in, and I, I mean, I honestly, being naive, I took one look at him and I thought, oh my, you're creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was I, he began to just tell me a story. And I realized he was just this wonderful human being that had been really invisible most of his life. I mean, invisible. And the part of his story, is at 18, he'd been returned back to his home by that point. He came home and all of his belongings were on the front porch and his mom and stepdad had moved to Tennessee and he was homeless. So he had came to Connorsville. He lived here when he was young and he came here to live with a, a kind of a relative that he, he knew uh, that wasn't biologically relative, but it was somebody that he had claimed as family. 
um, who also struggled with substance abuse. And I had met him once and called him back in to check on him because he had, he had been coming to class without, without a pen or paper and being, um, he'd been sent to our in-school suspension because he wasn't coming prepared. And so I was calling him in to say, hey, what's going on? Why are you not showing up, you know, with your, what you need? And uh, when I, I called him into my office that second time, I rounded the corner, and he sat there with uh, a black eye and a fat lip. And uh, I looked at him, I said, wow, it looks like you've had a, a really crappy week. <laughs> I think that's probably what I said exactly. And he looked at me and he said, more like a sucky life. And immediately his eyes filled up with tears. And um, my kid with a funky mohawk and crocodile feet hanging from carabiners in his ears just became a little boy. And uh, it's really when my job took on a different path. Because I think, I think when I, I started it, you have a, a preconceived idea of what you're going to get into. But in all reality, I didn't expect to find kids like this young man that had no one, you know, had no one. And, and so at that point, he shared with me that he was kind of staying with friends. He didn't have anything. He didn't have any clothes other than what was on his back. And the bag that he had that had his school supplies was at the house where the person had kicked him out. <clears throat> I'm not saying he was perfect. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he was 18 years old, though, as a freshman and had no family that was taking care of him. And uh, that kind of opened my eyes to, wow, you know, going into problem solve mode, what do we do to fix this? How can I, you know, I mean, like, I, I can't, I'm not comfortable, I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable knowing that I had this young man, like, sleeping from house to house and he'd slept outside and I wasn't okay with that. So I, I knew, I was new to Connersville. I had lived here before, but I began to just really look at what resources were available and in, in the long run um, began to try to help him find a job and within that week outside of school uh, had a, a, another adult male go with me and we job hunted and realized that it's, it's just impossible to get a job if you don't have an ID, you don't have an address, a telephone number, you, you know, it's just, it's really hard to pull yourself out of that cir circumstance. We, he couldn't even qualify for, you know, any kind of food stamps or any of that stuff because you just, if you don't have a place to, with an address associated with your name. And so um, he was all excited because he thought we were going to help him find a job. And my, the young man that was helping me try to find a job, we, the real, it, we were getting more ho-hum as the minutes passed when we realized, okay, the only social security number he has is the one that's tattooed to his arm. And um, we just realized, you know, it was going to be really hard to help him. And uh, I invited him. I said, hey, we're, we're starting this young adult thing on Friday nights originally. That was the plan. And we're going to have pizza. So in my mind, I just needed to feed him. You know, I, I couldn't, couldn't take him home with me. I couldn't. You know, I, I, what could I do to help him? And so I invited him to come for pizza. And he, he came for pizza two hours early and brought a friend with him. And by the time it was time to start, we had 19 kids that first night. And they were almost all just like him. They were a group of mm -hmm. kids that took care of themselves. That didn't and really all that age bracket 18 or younger? Younger. Or? They were younger. Mm -hmm. I had, in that original group, I think probably five or six of them were freshmen. And I, I had met uh, one girl that same week, and she was a little girl that was failing all of her all of her classes, and she had these dark rings around her eyes. And I looked at her and I said, "Sweetheart, what's bothering you the most? Like, what's bothering you the most?" And she said, "Well, all my friends have joined a gang." Again, I'm new to Connorsville. I'm thinking what? <laughs> and she said, yeah, she said, um, I know, you know, a couple of them are selling drugs and one of them uh, rang a doorbell and hit somebody the other day. And, and she said, they're going to, they're, they're going to get into some big trouble. And I know it's just about to happen. And I, they're my family. And again, being naive, I mean, I, this was just a few months into my job. I'm thinking, oh, what do I do with this information? Right. And, uh, that little girl, I just, you know, shared to her she could come talk to me about anything, anytime, and when she was ready to share, I would do anything I could to help her friends. And um, 
the crazy thing about that very first night, she was the last little girl that walked through the door. And she was, at the time, a freshman in high school, and these were her friends. They were the people she was talking about in my office. And uh, they looked creepy, I'm not gonna lie. To the mainstream eye, they were, um, you know, all wearing black trench coats and black nail polish and lipstick and eye makeup that um, ran down their face. And I remember thinking, you know, I've, I've gone on mission trips throughout, I mean, so my first trip was at 19 to the Philippines. And I remember thinking, I've just gotta love these kids. I mean, I've got to love them no matter what. And, and in all honesty, that was my prayer. You know, help me to just love the, them. And uh, Michelle Kelly was with me, and I know that I'm talking a long time. I oh, well, that's what we're here for. We're here to, uh, to, to find out. And I, this, this is, uh, I'm, people tell me about these kind of things in Connorsville all the time. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I check it out. They tell me there's people living under the bridge. I send a police officer over there. There's mm -hmm. nobody living under the bridge. But I, I need to know these things, and, mm -hmm. and we need to talk about them. And we know that you've been successful in changing a lot of lives. So, so oh. you talk on. Okay. Well, this little girl, um, when I really got to know her, one of her friends was selling drugs. And he, he was in high school. And I... I, it, it's really hard because outside of school, I, I mean, I didn't know him in school at all. He wasn't a kid I ever knew. But I know that the first time I ever sat down with him and talked to him, he was very candid that that wasn't the life he wanted. You know, and I think it was, it took trust. And I feel even vulnerable, you know, saying this just like here out in the open. But this is a young man that has since gone on and has two years of college under his belt, works every day and is a very involved father. And so I feel like he's a tremendous success that it would have been real easy to just write him off mm -hmm. as another person that is gonna go on and, and has, he's made, like could have easily been defined by the choices he was making at, at 17, 18. But in reality today, he has a full-time job and he's, he is, has really stepped up and has a child and is doing what he needs to do to support it and I'm so proud of him. But, and he had to choose, he had to want a different life. And so, but that group of original kids, they changed everything I could have ever thought about ministry, about reaching a generation of kids, because I realized that what, even though I had grown up in what I would consider a dysfunctional situation, it, it got way worse. And, uh, and is a lot of this due to the economics, drugs, what, or is it just society today, or what, what do we attribute all this? I well, mean, we, we, they tell me at the school we got kids that don't get a hot meal or any kind of meal from Friday till Monday, mm -hmm. that the only food they get is really at the school, and then of course on, you, you have fuel on Friday night, and gleaners have got some food programs in the summertime, and uh, is it is it just the economy and the poverty here? Is that no? I think it's I think it's even you know it would be so easy for us to look at what family used to look like, and today family is very different, and I think we've grown a, a group of people that have had to take care of themselves so long, and I say this very carefully because I I genuinely am not judging people and I love all people. I think we have a lot of kids that are raising themselves because their parents don't know how to take care of themselves. And they've had children, and they emotionally only know how to give so much. And so like, mm -hmm. in my, if I look at my original group of people, and I know their parents, and I love them, and I've spent time at their houses and on their front porches, and I am not passing judgment on any world. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, my little girl that I'm talking about that was a freshman at that time, uh, for the most part, School was out at the end of, I mean, end of that school year, and she pretty much stayed with friends and anywhere she wanted where to stay. Where she wanted to. And no one really so made her come home. So what's the final story on her, is she? She um, and the young man that I was talking about have a baby together, and she did not graduate. Uh, he, she is, but she is now a volunteer at the Hope Pregnancy Center. She's a kid that, um, this fall, we did a fall retreat, and she, at the time was trying to do some CPL classes at the high school and she said to me, Holly, I want to go not as a kid but as your help. And she said, whatever it is that you need that whole weekend, I just want to be the person that will take care of you. 
and that's that little girl now. I mean, mm -hmm. um, she's seriously, we've started fuel four years ago right now. I would say probably five, maybe ten times in the four years is all she's not been there. And, I mean, consistently is there, mm -hmm. consistently came, comes to church. She's definitely not using drugs. She's sleeping at home every night, and she knows what she needs to do as far as raising her child. Like, he's, he's a happy little boy, and um, I think probably by the time I met her when she was, at the time, almost 16, I mean, some of her academic stuff, she was already in a deficit. I mean, she yeah. didn't, you don't just pick up and gain all that information. It takes years. It yeah. takes years to reta regain yeah. it. And so success, I think, has taught me um, this job and looking at success, I look at it differently. Because I think I went in thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, every kid's going to graduate. Or, you know, mm -hmm. that, and it, I, you know, my, you know, the father of uh, her, her baby's father, he, he did go on to college. And at the time, he, he might not have graduated. He was about to fail uh, a science class that he had to have. And you know what? F we sat down and studied. He and I, after school, one night, one night, went through and made flashcards. And I wouldn't let him stop until he got every one of those flashcards from the study guide right. And he, on the last period of the day, the last day of high school, took his final exam for integrated chemistry and physics and got the highest score out of, like, I don't know how many sections of it, and graduated. That's good. But he, you know, I think it just took somebody really believing in them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, that is, that's how fuel started. And I feel like you really almost need to know about those kids to know it, that. It was, that, it was kind of, it was born here out of a need. And, and it wasn't uh, like something, you know, we try to come up. It wasn't planned. You didn't have a, a strategic a plan. You didn't hire anybody to write the curriculum. You didn't have any engineer to uh, tell you how to do it. You, it. you just did what it took to, and, and to make you know, it happen. And we just loved them. And you know, most things work better when you do them that way. I got I to tell you a little story. When uh, I had my kids, these last kids, late in life, 50s, and uh, started taking them down to Grandview School uh, when they got to be five, six years old. And it wasn't long before uh, it was the eight weeks or nine weeks were up and they were going to have the awards program. So the kids said, Dad, you're going to come to the awards program? And I said, yeah, what is that? I, in my, my day, we didn't have anything like that. You know, uh, anyway, I, yeah, we go down there. So we go down and all the kids from second grade up are sitting on the gym floor and they began to give these awards away. And it's an academic award, and it's this award and that award. And I noticed after about three or four times down there, well, it's the same kids in every class get it every nine weeks. And all the rest of the kids sat there on the floor just kind of squirming around, nothing in it for them. So I went to the principal, Miss Lichty, and I said, you know, this, this don't seem right to me. Of course, you know want to run a school better than I do. What do I know about running a school? But I said, uh, at the same time, Mac Machine started a, uh, an award down there, and I forget what they called it, but they gave an award away, the uh, Mac Machine Award. I said, I think I want to start an award. She said, well, what do you want to start? I said, I want to start the most improved in each class. And I think we gave them a $10 bill and a certificate. And uh, so the rest of the time that I had kids at Grandview, every nine weeks I went down, and we did this award program. and. Uh, it, it got a lot of kids that never got to work. But one time, I think it was the first in the kindergarten, they don't take to the gym, so we would go to the room to give the award. And the teacher would take me in, or the principal, and uh, then the uh, teacher would pick the person the award, you know. And I remember she said, this little boy, he had little thick glasses, and kind of sandy red hair, and she called his name. And the little boy went, me? Like, Never got an award in his life. Yeah. I think I realized that day that we need a success coach in first grade. Because if, if a kid doesn't feel he's important or doesn't amount to anything, that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah. And more so in our society today because he doesn't, you know, if a kid was like that in my day, he had parents at home to help him, to back him. And for, it's like you described, we, a lot of parents just don't care. Or... They they're too, to. they're, well, they're struggling to make a living. Mm -hmm. 
they're struggling with life that they didn't learn themselves, I guess, like you said. But I've told uh, the principal, I've told the superintendent, I think we need a success coach. You need to catch those kids in first grade, and if you can make a kid feel there's something in them, you know, now you get the guy that's just good at basketball, he's going to feel good, and whether he gets good grades or not, he's going to work at it. Uh, same thing in soccer. Or this. But the little kid that just can't do much of anything, he's good at something. He's good at being invisible. Right. So I know what you're talking about. I know how this evolves. Well, let's, let's talk about fuel. So fuel's on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And should we say what fuel stands for the letters? Uh, and, and tell me about that. You've told me twice, but I, <laughs> tell me again. Well, fuel actually, when it first started, was meant to be like gasoline. Gasoline, yeah, that's good. You know, good. like your car takes yeah. gasoline to go. Yeah. And so I thought of fuel as in, and it's not even original, I can't take credit for it. I had a group in, in Colorado that we called ourselves Fuel. And it was basically because we wanted to fuel our, our passion <laughs> for the Lord, really. It's a, it's a Christian program. And we uh, started Fuel, and that's how it was. Well, we started with these, these kids, to quite honestly, that were very gothic. And I had probably four or five that were not. And, but it was largely for about the first, first year we were very gothic. Well, then Rick didn't, at the time, he didn't know the role that he was playing. But at Calvary, they had a group of mainstream type kids that had started to come within the first four months of Fuel. And they, they came with the intent to serve. Like their plan was to come in and help serve food and wipe tables and take out trash. And I think what happened is they came in and found the same kind of love and acceptance that my gothic kids came. And I think they continue to grow. And so today, we're, we run 80 or so, maybe sometimes even as many as 100. We've had. On Friday evenings. On Friday evenings at 9 o'clock at night. And where do you do this? At, right now we're at Cross Point Biker Church. Cross Point Biker Church, okay. Uh, but anyway, we run this crazy, now large group of young people. And they are everything. They're not just, my gothic kids aren't even as gothic as they used to be. You know, like the ones that originated, <laughs> yeah. they don't. They don't look the same. And then we've acquired new kids each year because, you know, some get older and they don't come as often. And it's kind of the natural selection of life. But the whole principle in the first place was to feed these kids, wasn't it? Um, well, the one kid, but no, it was like, it was going to be like a youth, only young adult style, like youth group mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. activity. But uh, actually at the time, Temple had a, uh, a youth pastor that came out one night to speak. And at, at the time, I think we were running about, 50, 60, and he looked at the crowd and he said, Holly, I think this should be, I think fuel should stand for friends under every label. He said, this yeah. is the most, this, yeah, that's good. Yeah. this group of people. And so friends under every label stuck. It wasn't intended, you know, that wasn't the, the brainchild of the title, but it has become that. And I think if you look, like, I know that, like, Heidi has been. She's been out to fuel. Mm -hmm. Been out to fuel. We have a wide Variety, variety of, of kids. kids that come, yeah. and it's not just any one type of kid that's there now. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you have uh, kids of this nature and kids of that nature, all those things will rub off on different kids, and they'll learn from each other, and, and just I, hope they learn all good things. Well, and you know, I think, and I, I feel like I'm going to say this, and maybe it's a can of worms that I shouldn't, but I think I should. I think in the beginning, some mainstream families were like afraid for their kids to come because they thought that. They might be influenced poorly mm -hmm. by other kids that might be there. And I actually think it's, it's the exact opposite that happens. I think that kids a lot of times think they have it hard. And when they meet kids who really, really do. Really have it hard. They realize what they got. So I think probably some of my most mainstream kids that come have realized that they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. It's a ministry for them. Yeah. It is, and you know, any. But I they do it unbeknownst to the other kids. Yeah. They, they do, and it's not even. Oh. It's not even once. It's not even like that because what yeah. happens is, if you go think you're going to serve, you're going to be changed as well. So as much as you yeah. think it's like a mission trip to a foreign country, you go, you think you're going to go build a house and you're going to leave and you're going to feel good that you've done something, and the people who are there that you're building a house for, they wreck your heart. They change your. They change your mindset. Mm -hmm. They you you cannot leave the same, mm -hmm. and so essentially. There's really, it's so circular, you don't know who's being ministered to and who's not. Well, we're we're, um, we're going to move over here to 
Thanks. Uh, Mr. Hartzell. Yeah. So you're cleaning the carpets and picking up fires and you're doing all that. How in the world did you get mixed up in fuel? You're too old for it in the first place. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, well uh, my, my uh, granddaughters, I, I've got 11 grandkids and um, uh, they, they were telling me about Holly and they, they, they really, she, they tell me what a good person she was and how they've gone out and helped her. And um, so I called Holly and Holly kind of voided me for a little while there. But uh, she called me up one day and uh, she said, uh, hey, I, I'm looking for a building that is on neutral ground where we can, we can meet. It's uh, close to where a lot of these uh, kids live. Um, so I said, I'll get back with you. I got back with her in a few days and I had three buildings for her. And uh, one was the CEC building and she said that don't have to go any farther. That's the one, the six story building. So um, we uh, went on and um, got with uh, Janet uh, with the CEC and uh, talk to the board and uh, I go Holly it's this is going to be a project here uh, so that's basically how I got up with uh, Holly and the more the more I got to know her and Holly and some of the kids uh, so do you, do you attend fuel on I, I right? have a couple times my wife and I have okay. but my you don't on a regular here. basis no no yeah. uh, Hall, Holly has a lot, though. yeah I've came a few you, yeah even more than a few times mm -hmm. he's been he shows yeah. up Holly has a lot of great volunteers and yeah. uh, I think um, your church um, supplies a bus takes them home a lot of the kids uh, do you pick I, them up too Rick or uh, Tim Bearclaw right, drives a van and he's been mm -hmm. doing that since the beginning I think but yeah he picks them up and drives them off at you know, 12, 1 o'clock when they're all finished. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. So that's all you get involved with. You're talking about your grandkids that their grandmother lives across the street from me. Yeah. Yeah, they're good kids. Yeah, they are. And my, and my, my uh, kids if uh, My other daughters. Uh, yeah, girls. yeah. Um, also, um, we always have a Christmas party every year. And um, we had a Christmas party, and um, I, always, I always get the... We get blow up things and the kids, they play and I get them candy. Um, my employees, kids, and um, one, one time um, I told them uh, leave everything up. We're gonna have a, leave this. We're gonna have um, something, you know, for some kids that are a little unfortunate and uh, the next day. And the JCs, we always join in with the JCs on that. Well, Holly brought a lot of the kids this year. But anyway, one of the little girls um, of one of my employees, she came up as she was leaving and she had this big bag of candy and she says, you know, I don't need this. I want you to break this tomorrow. And boy, it really touched me. And Holly's kids came the next day and they were real appreciative uh, of anything they got, it, even if it wasn't much. Uh, it's uh, got a lot of thank yous and they were really polite kids. Holly's done a really good job with them and uh, they uh, it, it was it was a really a good time I think. Oh Rick uh, do you attend Fuel on Friday nights? I have I tried honestly for most of the time this started to stay away if I'm honest I've got three small children and um, <clears throat> being a youth minister where I'm at I prayed for Holly I prayed for them and I thought if I go I'm gonna fall in love and I won't be able to leave. And uh, as Holly shared, some of my students were there and a couple of students got an opportunity to speak. I thought I can't not go. Uh, these guys are gonna be speaking and so I went uh, that, that first uh, time and heard one of the students speak and that's what happened. <laughs> kind of fell in love and um, me and Holly have done some dreaming together of how you know we can do some more and, and just reach the city and uh, but it's a great program out there and seeing 80 to 100 kids in any place being unified and you know it's not fighting it's not tension it's not somebody's turf it's you know everybody's there 
and, and they're smiling and, the, and they're growing. It's, it's really a, a great thing. Okay. Well, you know, we've talked about kids, we've talked about parents, and uh, if you had a message to give to parents tonight, just a, a simple message, two or three lines, I'd be interested in what the three of you, uh, let's start with you. Uh, what would you say is the most important thing a parent can do or for their kids in a short? You're saying I'm long-winded, aren't you? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, my, my mom did something right, and that was no matter when I came in at night, she wanted to know about my day. And she stopped whatever it was she was doing and gave me her undivided attention. And I think there... You can't put a dollar amount on that. On that, I think the number one thing a, a parent needs to do is no matter how late it is or how busy the day, is every single day stop and talk to your kid <coughs> and listen. It's so easy to talk, and there's so many messages that you have to give, but listening, I mean, you have two ears and one mouth, and from a chatty Kathy, you have to listen twice as much as you speak. So listen, which really incorporates love. Mm -hmm. You gotta have the love that you. Yeah. What would you say, uh, Rick? I tell people I get this question a lot: is what is the biggest struggle for students today? And you have a lot of things across the board that are just things, but I think the biggest struggle is their identity. Who am I going to be, and where am I going to fit? And so. If you'll answer some of that, you know, kids want to belong. They want acceptance. And, um, you know, if that's not coming first at the home level, if they don't, and this is what, you know, I'm echoing what Holly said, but uh, if there's love not felt at home first, then they're going to seek it out, and it's going to shape who they become. Uh, in the teen years, especially junior high and the freshman year, they are making decisions about who they're going to become that will, will follow them the rest of their life. So helping them shape their identity. Before we go any further, we have the number up on the screen now. It's 825-3245 if there's anybody out there tonight listening. As I told you when we started, sometimes we get a lot of calls in the spring like this when people can be outside and play tennis and do all the fun things. Uh, they don't pay attention, but we'll show this program over and over through the next 30 days. And over the 30 days, there'll be a whole lot of people that will take the time and watch this program. So what you say tonight is really important because you're speaking from your hearts and you're talking about the youth. Uh, Gary Breitenball did a program on generational poverty. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to see his program. I think I've seen it twice. And I never realized that how important that was that kids, you just keep growing up in a cycle. Mm -hmm. But I have a, a few ideas of my own because I grew through it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to school, uh, the first thing you did is you had prayer in school and we took turns praying and then we had the pledge and uh, every week we could bring something in. I think they call it show and tell. Uh, we had experiences that we talked about uh, something after we got older, we would take, they called it current events, and you could bring something in. Um, I think that was a way to keep the kids involved. I, I can remember way back in the fourth grade who was the best prayer. So that person had that quality. There, there were things like that that we did. And I've seen deterioration ever since we removed prayer from the school because we were so afraid we were going to offend somebody by having the wrong religion. And you know what? Through my business in the funeral home, I work with everybody's religion, everybody. And I don't think I've ever offended anybody because we can accept everybody's religion. We can accept everybody's color of their hair, shape of their body. And I tell a lot of people, uh, especially at the mayor's office, the, come down there all mad about their trash or they come down mad about their neighbor or their grass or you know it's so much more fun to love one another than it is to fight and and I think as we get older uh, we mellow out I know uh, I hear a lot of drama with a 17 year old 
girl in my home, you know, you, you get a lot of drama. And I said, does it cost you anything? No. Is it going to change your life? No. Then why worry about it? Let it fly. Who cares if your hem's crooked? Who cares if your eyelash isn't straight, you know? But, uh, Mr. Hartzell, you uh, give me that one line or what, what you think. Now, from your experience working here, working with your grandchildren. Well, you, you know, um, uh, I, I talk to, when I talk to my grandkids and that and my kids, you can, you can go get them a video game or you can do this or you can buy them a bicycle. But if, if you ask them what they got for Christmas 10 years ago, they haven't got a clue. But if you said, do you remember when we went to and, oh, yeah, yeah. we did this and that. They remember those little things when you just went places. It's just like Holly and Rick said, and I think everybody will agree. Mm -hmm. Just that little bit of time. Uh, I worked a lot when I was younger, and, um, but we still tried to make a little time and uh, do something. Um, we do a lot more now with uh, all the kids, but just a little bit of time with them. I, I have so many kids come into uh, my shop and want to uh, try to get a job, fill out applications. They come in in pairs or they'll come in in threes. Or and I go, look, it, you know, nobody's really taught them how to uh, get a job. I'm, I'm sure maybe there was some lessons in school, but, you know, they just, they don't have some of the skills to know what, what, what it takes to get a job or go, how to go about getting one. Um, it, it, just some little things. Spend a little time with the, okay. the children. We're going to change the clock completely now because we're trying to move fuel into its own headquarters, into its own home. And I'm, I've been with you on that a little bit. I know you came over to City Council, not the last meeting, the meeting before, talking about putting a, a fire rated drywall on the ceiling. And uh, the City Council was very receptive to it. I was. Uh, I was really pleased the way they accepted that because money is very tight and they're, they're struggling to keep a roof on their own buildings, but they were willing to help. And then I, uh, I was, uh, you know, the fire chief works for me and he came in and he said, you know, I hate to throw cold water on you, but we've got some problems here we got to work through. He said, I can't approve that building until it's safe. And he said, I've got to go through uh, Indianapolis. They've got to inspect it. And uh, so I said to the city council this last Monday night, I said, let's table this for a little bit until we see if we get this worked out. In the meantime, I've gone to Bill McDaniel, and he's basically told me the same thing that the fire chief told me. We've got to get a certificate from the state that we can make it safe and make it where kids can be in there. So uh, that's a challenge that we're all working on. we we got to work out. Um, is, is there any alternative building that could be used in the meantime or, or, or full time? Is there, a, is there a plan B? If I, I just finished a building in the park and believe me, I, I know, it's got to be handicap accessible. It's got to have handicap restrooms. It's got to have fire rated this. It's got to have knobs you can turn here. I mean, I know how difficult it is. Um, is, there a, is there a plan B? Um, I am or, I am open to a plan B. I'm not, I think, and I want to be careful in what I say, just because I feel like I've had this, this realization, and it's funny that Mike has become such a good friend of mine, he and his wife, because I really believe that we're in a restoration business. We're in a um, salvaging. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, like this community yeah. as a whole, I think... Um, I've been on this, like lately it's really been, it's been clear to me that, you know, that it's easy to, to see the bad. And, you know, even in the Bible it says we're, we'll be known by our fruit. And I feel like at this season in my life and what I'm, I'm getting to be a part of, and even what I'm seeing in these kids' life, I don't want to just put it aside like it's impossible. Oh, well, it's not. It's it's wholly possible. I've been I've been talking with people, and then as I ride around town, I'm like this, I'm looking at every building in Are town. You and we worked with this summer discovery ever since I've been mayor. Mm -hmm. It is such a great program in the North End, and it's always been my desire 
to have summer discovery in the south end where the kids could walk to summer discovery and where we could do a maybe a little different type program yeah. because it's in the south end where the kids need it even more than we need it up in the north end although we could use a lot of the same facilities if we had transportation back and forth but uh, I, and I talked to Dr. Hodges about the the old Presbyterian church over here that has a mm -hmm. kind of a gym built on the back of it and it's I, I don't think it's being used at all right now mm -hmm. and uh, I wondered if if that was possible to get that in the interim period or you know sometimes I believe and I tell a lot of companies this they'll come in here and they'll say we want the Visteon building yeah. well how many employees are you going to have 32 yeah. Well, there's 40 acres under the roof, mm -hmm. and the light bill is 5,000 a month. Are you sure you want 30, you don't want mm -hmm. this building? Well, we didn't know that. Could we just use a corner of it? No, the state won't let you go in a corner. You got to fix it up. You know, you got to have mm -hmm. a security system. You got to have a fire system. Yeah. Gotta... But is there is there any way that something like that could work in the meantime? Not to edit, not to use it as a church, just use it as a building. Yeah, yeah. And, and I am I am very much open to looking at other mm -hmm. uh, other other. And options. I don't even know. I I know there's a debt on that, uh, and I know the Church of God owns that building, but it's not being used at all. And I I have been in that back end, and it's mm -hmm. a nice kitchen, and it's a nice area for games, and and then you can have programs or stuff in the front part there. I look at that. Uh, I looked at several other buildings, but the, the cost is way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a building where the employment agency used to be, but I think the cost is prohibitive there. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you could find a building that's already approved for public use, yeah. you could step in there, and then as you grow, grow into something else, you get a thousand kids, well, we need a building for a thousand kids, you know. Uh, one of my concerns, and I'm just being completely honest about going into a building that looks like a church, mm -hmm is there's a lot of stereotypes or connections with churches. Church. They see a building, they see a steeple, mm -hmm. they automatically assume something, mm -hmm. and it's unapproachable to someone who's terrified of going into a church. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot you of, know, I hear a lot of churches tell me that, and mm -hmm. what they do a lot of times is they'll go into a uh, storefront building. Yeah. Uh, a storefront building. And there's mm -hmm. some of those. I've looked at some of those. And you would think with the empty buildings we got around here that, but I have looked at every building ever since I talked with you. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, I'm open, and I, I, I think probably anybody who knows me would know that I'm a dreamer, and it, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse mm -hmm. because I see so much potential that needs to happen, and I believe this isn't a one-woman show like, like Rick has said and, and Mike. I have lots of people that are gifted and talented and are ready to jump in and start serving and doing other programming once we are in a spot where we can... You know, right now we're limited to what we can do um, with the availability of the building that we use f for free. And I'm very thankful for Crosspoint. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but in the future, there's so many things that we'd like to do. And I think probably very quickly. I drove out and looked at the Elkhorn School. It would be ideal, but it's so darn far out there. It's so far. We yeah. need Transportation. something. Transportation. Yeah. But wouldn't that be something? Got a big gym. And oh, yeah. Got a nice kitchen and a uh, big yard. But it's so far out there. And so expensive to heat, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it would be wonderful if, you know, I, and it, it part of just just putting it out there that, that my heart, the reason I love the CEC building so much is because you wouldn't have to use the whole building. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's set there since the 1800s. If we could refurbish just the one floor, mm -hmm. I'd, I wouldn't have a problem at all having a five-story attic mm -hmm. because it's a wide open space. You can see there's no place to hide. Have you uh, have you any contact this week with uh, the fire chief and those are with it? I haven't talked to Troy this week. Yeah, I, I've talked to uh, Mr. McDaniels and the fire chief this week. We've got a call into the uh, state fire marshal. Uh, we're kind of missing each other. Um, Clarel Strasberg, who does my estimating, and uh, he's um, he's pretty up on the codes and everything. Uh, We've we've uh, we've got a call into him. He's he's a pretty. They're really short on people at the state level, and um, we hope to get get some answers from him later on. Uh, most of them are fire issues. Uh, they put a lot of money into this building, and by doing the remodeling, I I assumed that the it was changed from um, industrial to uh, assembly. Well, it, 
it hasn't been changed. And it's still zoned industrial? Yes. And that's when I went to get permits uh, with Mr. McDaniels, that's where I found out about this. And um, he said, well, you're going to have to submit to the state first, and then we can get the permits. And then uh, everything was good. And um, then we started the uh, fire and uh, with the fire marshals and that. And they're really working with us, trying to get this, this building to go. Be, and, and I think just for the kids mainly and for the for the building it's been so much money put into it I think everybody's yeah, another question that the city council it. members asked me said well it, it's for sale what happens right. if we put this money into it mm -hmm. and it sells and somebody wants to put a store in there mm -hmm. uh, then what happens with the money we put into it so those are questions and I you gave me the questions here and there's nothing we can solve tonight but if there is anybody out there that's got a couple of million dollars <laughs> or maybe five hundred thousand, or three hundred thousand, or fifty thousand, or five dollars. You could call these people right here. They need the money. Yeah. And uh, you are uh, you're putting your money into a great thing because the future of the community and the future of the country is certainly children. And after this week, if you can't see that we've got problems, mm. you're blind. Uh, it's amazing to me that anybody would want to kill another human being. But I have a habit of, when I get up in the morning about quarter to six, turning on channel eight. Mm -hmm. And every single night of the week, there's one to three to four murders. I lived in Indianapolis when I went to college. And uh, I walked up and down the streets. I'd walk downtown. Never thought, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that today. Uh, in Connorsville, six years ago, I took over as mayor. And I, I work close with the police department. Um, I, I'm back there a lot. I see what goes on. I know what goes on. The fire chief works it for me, so he keeps me informed. Last night when the drug raid was taking place, uh, I knew all about it. He, he keeps me informed. He'll call me before they do it, tell me how safe they're going to be and everything. Cause it, if it goes wrong, it embarrasses him and the mayor. So, And every mayor gets those privileges. But uh, I know... In just this year, we're into the fourth month, our police have been threatened, shot at, knives pulled, beat up, tore their uniforms. And six years ago, those things weren't happening in Connorsville. Now, I still brag, and I brag every Today, I was in Indianapolis and trying to coerce company into coming here. And I said, you know, we only have a murder every 10 years. And that's a, that's a regular thing. About every t If you divide it out, it's about every 10 years. Mm -hmm and we're safe. And they said, what about your drugs? And I said, well, we probably have as much drug problem as anybody, but I know that the police officers are working hard. Uh, I have a police radio in my car, and I have one in home and one in my office. And if you would listen to the calls that they get, and they, they get calls like this, I can't handle my 16-year-old daughter. Will you come? Quick. Mm -hmm. she, the, the parents are being threatened. Things that in, in our day, that, that never happened. I was scared to death of mom and dad both. And mother would tell dad, and dad had the razor strap, and it mm -hmm. wasn't good. You know, I, if it's okay for me to jump in here. Jump. The other night. This is your program. Oh, well. I'm just a moderator. About a month ago, one of my young men that was there that very first night was in town, and he, he said, do you have some time? And so he and I sat over at Taco Bell and played chess. And I'm not a chess player. I've never really played a lot of chess. But Mike's granddaughter had came in, um, a couple of them, was the younger ones. And we were teaching her how to play chess. And I, I know you're saying, well, wait, where are we going with this? But I, my young man was teaching her how to play chess. And when I looked at that chess board, I was so focused on protecting my king and queen that I wasn't at all thinking about taking his pieces. And I think that's how our, our world has become. We think about protecting, and so we're always on the defense. We're never on the offense. And it has hit me more than ever lately with, you know, the substance abuses and things like that. If we are always fighting the problem and never thinking about getting past the problem, we can be blinded like the forest for the trees. And I, I really feel like part of with our youth and with our community is instead of... Um, 
being so focused on what we can do to protect them, we have to start thinking about what we're going to do to get them past where we are this very minute. Does, am, are, are you with me? I'm with you. I'm and, with you. and I feel like part of even that building and what this community has invested in it is hope deferred. It's like something is impossible. And I think we have to, as a community, we have to like not be so focused on highest in teen pregnancy, you know, uh, premature death rates, low baby birth weights, all of those bad statistics, we have kind of almost taken pride in it. Well, let me tell you, all of those bad statistics are not current statistics. They're back a few years. Mm -hmm. In many ways, we've improved a good bit. Yeah. I get that stuff come across my desk all the time. Yeah. And uh, things are not as bad mm -hmm. as they were. We, we are a little bit on the upswing. If we could, uh, if we could boost our economy somewhat, mm -hmm. uh, boost our education and graduation rate, mm -hmm. and make our friends, our kids feel that there's something in them. And there's more. We, we, could, we could go a long way. And our community has a lot to offer, Tons. just not the lack of murder, but it, you know, people that come here and just live a year or two, they'll say, man, when I came here, I didn't want to come here. I didn't want to live here. And I talk to them all the time. They'll say, since I've been here, I've got friends. I feel like I'm a part of something and they like it. He's just whispered in my ear three minutes. So you got about a half a minute to tell me something good. Oh, my half a minute to for something would, would have to be, we have to invest in these kids. We have to show them that there's more. And it's so easy, the generational stuff, we cyclic do the same thing because it's the only thing we've ever known. And the only way that's gonna change is if we help them see a different way. Rick? Uh, I have to believe that this is gonna happen. We're talking about a lot of possible maybe, but I've seen so much happen and the benevolence of people in Connorsville and people want to get behind youth and want to support and uh, we've seen in just a short amount of time a lot of people come behind because they're willing whether they're faith-based or not they want to see this and so I challenge everybody to join in jump on board we right. uh, we uh, we've been doing this for about uh, what a year together now I would say but Holly and I have gone around to uh, different groups, and we've just been accepted. Just unbelievable. They've they've offered us money, volunteers. Uh, just uh, one Saturday, I went around. We put what was it? Two pool tables, slate pool tables. Uh, just the people. It, they they want these kids to have something, and uh, there's a lot of good people out there, and. Uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Okay. I got to do a little commercial here tonight. We have a chicken dinner from 4 to 8 on uh, Saturday this week, the 20th. The uh, chicken dinner is $8, and uh, it's, it's less for kids. And it's KSC's frying the chicken. It's the best chicken you've ever eaten. If you had it, they have it at the park in the summertime. Mashed potatoes and all the trimmings for 8 bucks. You can't go any place and eat for that money. And all that money will be given to the Roberts Park 4-H building. Um, the chicken is being paid for, so uh, we, we don't have to take the chicken out of the, out of the cost of the ticket. All that money. We need that money. we got to get that finished by the bicentennial. Don't forget the bicentennial. Uh, I don't know if it's next month or the following month. We will have bicentennial. But tonight we've been uh, pleased. We thank you for watching tonight. We ask you to watch next month. And thank you so much, and uh, good night from all of us.